Welcome to the October 4th, 2017 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, the main focus of our meeting today is to have applicants uh, present to us. We're going to go in the order of Community Housing Supportive Services first, St. John's Episcopal, uh, Episcopal Church uh, second, and then the Office of Planning and Sustainability will finish up with the last three. Folks are welcome to stay for the whole meeting, but folks that are presenting are also welcome to leave um, once, once your portion of the evening is done. Uh, before we get going on that, though, just a couple things. First is, is there any general public comment? These are not from the presenters, but anyone speaking to us as a committee and a, with any sort of comments? No? Okay, we have one, uh, the minutes of the May 5th. 2017 meeting to approve. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? I would say um, one thing, Brian, that from my perspective, I'm having a very hard time going back months to try and remember the fine points of the minutes. And I'm wondering if we can't have another system in place that. Uh, the minutes are, are written up and presented in a, in a uh, more timely fashion. Uh, we will do our best to try to move that along. Thank you. That's a very valid comment. I can't remember what happened to a week ago, let alone what is whatever that is four months ago. So thanks, Jeff. That's a, that's a good, that's a very good suggestion. Uh, any other discussion on the minutes? Uh, all those voting to approve, oppose, we are good to go. Uh, let's see, Chair's report, um, just a couple quick comments. Uh, there were a number of us that were able to get to uh, two of the site visits today, uh, which was to St. John's and also the Academy of Music, so thanks for folks, uh, some of the folks uh, that were presenting in entertaining our questions then. Uh, Sarah has suggested that we um, uh, put off the open space acquisition site visit until a date in the future, correct? Uh, it seems to work okay for most people to do it immediately prior to the next meeting. Okay. The so that will work. Do we have a time on that? Uh, 5.30? 5.30. And do we know where you send that out? Yes, exactly we'll where. Great, okay. good, thank you. And that will be our only, our third and only, or last site visit, correct? Uh, there was eight, a, did you say 18? Uh, the 18 at 5.30 at the location that Sarah will, Sarah will give us. Welcome to the mine, sort of a Halloween <laughs> kind of thing. Um, the question that came up that Ann asked, that I guess I'll ask uh, Sarah to, to tell us a little bit about, is has there been any movement on the trail and kiosks uh, at the Haydenville line, the mm -hmm. new conservation area there, you know, on Route, right on route 9? Yes. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at the corrosion control facility, there is a kiosk sort of hiding in the woods over there, so that's been constructed by the Sheriff's Department. And there was some back and forth with the Department of Public Works about whether it was most appropriate to have the parking where it was initially proposed. I guess DEP had some concerns about the security of the facility, so that may be moved to the other side, so that's been part to of the, the other side of the street? Uh, no, the other side of the corrosion. Of the corrosion, oh, good. So it's, we'll still be on the same. Yeah. Side. And uh, there was some logging down the box earlier in the spring. Great. So trail is not in place yet? Or? Not yet. And is there a date, set date for that? Is it? Uh, I don't know. I can check the front of the okay. And any other questions on that no. project? Thanks. Okay, so let's um, get right into this. Uh, the way that we do these meetings with applicants, and thank you all for coming, is that uh, we have hopefully all read the proposal that you have submitted uh, to us. Uh, we've had a chance to submit some questions in writing to you that you've gotten back to us. And then some of us have also gone, at least for St. John's, on a, a tour of 
the uh, facility to look at the scope of services. Um, so what is helpful for us is for you to make an initial presentation, knowing full well that we have read the proposal, but it's always good to highlight the main points, whatever you feel is, is appropriate for us. And then uh, open it up to questions from our CPC members. So we'll begin with the uh, Community Housing Supportive Services. And if you can introduce yourself, please. Sure, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Gordon Shaw, and I'm sort of here wearing two hats. I'm, I am a member of the uh, Northampton Housing Partnership, and I was also part of the team that uh, conceived of and wrote the first application that we submitted, a uh, successful application that we submitted in 2014. But I'm also an attorney, and I, and I work for Community Legal Aid, and I specialize in, in representing tenants, and I also can speak from the perspective of the need uh, that goes on with tenants who are facing eviction. With me is Peg Heller, who staffs the housing partnership uh, from the mayor's office, and Luis Martinez from the Center for Human Development. Uh, which is the, uh, the vendor that's been uh, support, uh, providing the services under this grant. Um, I'm here to speak to the need and, and if this question and eligibility of this project and, and Peg is, is available to talk to anything concerning the budget and sustainability of the project and the out and questions about outcome measurements and things like that. And Lewis is here to answer questions so should you have any for him as well. But I want to begin just by making it clear that I think this is an eligible project. I think it's clear that when the uh, CPA was amended in 2012, um, uh, and they added uh, a definition for what in support of community housing meant, it was clear that you could provide services to individual families, uh, uh, to families and individuals who are eligible for community housing. Of course, as you know, community housing is defined as low and income, moderate housing. Uh, Low and mo uh, housing available for low and, and low and moderate income families. Essentially, we're talking about affordable housing here in the Um And so, while spurring on the production of affordable housing is definitely a worthy goal of CPA, I think that when you look at why the legislature put in that that phrase "support of," they realize that something more is needed than just the production of affordable housing. And I'm here to tell you why that is the case. Um, this often comes as a surprise to folks, but if you ever, if you spend time down in housing court, um, it comes as a surprise that about 50% of all the cases that go through an eviction process involve people who are in affordable housing. Um, a small percentage of those are people who are probably being evicted for what we call bad conduct types of cases. And maybe they did something, there's a criminal act that they committed, or they're maybe committing fraud in the program, maybe they're just causing disturbances in the program. But the vast majority of people who, who are in community housing still face the problem of eviction for non-payment or rent. Um, but when you think about, and, and that should be a surprise, because when you think about what is affordable housing, affordable housing is supposed to be rent set or set that are affordable for, for low-income families. But when you think about the real numbers that are involved, um, and just give you some numbers here, you know, it's very typical for someone who's living in a, a, a subsidized unit to be on social, uh, social Security Disability Income, $900 a month of income. So their rent's gonna be somewhere between 30 and 40% of that income. So they're gonna pay maybe $300 a month in that. Maybe they've got $600 left to pay all of their other expenses. What happens, you know, so you've gotta pay for your food, you've gotta pay for your utility bills, you've gotta pay for your clothing, maybe even some, some entertainment. But what happens when an unanticipated expense comes up? And I can tell you from my own experience, the things that get people evicted for non-payment of rent, it's not a choice that people make that they don't pay their rent, it's because something came up that they couldn't, that they just made a bad, they had to make a very awful choice over what to pay. Um, maybe it's a car repair, $500 bill, rent money goes into the car bill because they need to get to work. Maybe it's because they, uh, it was, you know, their electric bill got out of hand. They've had a, they, they heat with their electricity and, and it's been a cold spell and so the, the electric bill just got higher than what they anticipated. I've even seen folks who fall behind because they make the horrible choice of using their rent money to bury a family member because there's no, other, there's no one else that can do it in the family. All with the hope that I'll catch up later, I'll catch up later. But when you're on a fixed income, you know, it's very difficult to get caught up very difficult to get caught up. 
and if fi finally you see yourself spiraling out of control, and the next thing you know, you're being served with a 14-day notice to quit, which is the first step in any eviction process, and that's followed with a summons to go to court. There are not lawyers to help all of these folks that go through housing court. Um, I'm one of those lawyers, and we, we don't have the capacity to serve all of these people. But I should also add that not all of these, even though these are legal cases, they don't all really need a lawyer. I mean, there, there are certainly many of these cases really involve the ability to find resources to help these people who are uh, to be able to sustain their tendencies. You know, and I'm all, I should just want to span what, what's going on a little bit in terms of folks that, fall, folks that find themselves in, in court. I also am very involved in, in access to justice issues statewide. I'm on a state committee uh, working on issues to, to figure out why folks who are unrepresented in court don't act in advance of court to either protect their rights or take steps to even resolve those legal issues. They just wait to show up in court and deal with it then. And I've been in focus groups with, 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 with low-income folks, and the thing that always comes through is this feeling of powerlessness when confronted with the legal problem. They just don't know what to do, and there's often this, this sense of shame, embarrassment, and, 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 they, just, and they, just, they just ignore the problem until it's no longer something they can ignore. And that's very much what happens in our courts here in, in Western Mass, and here in Tadley, where the housing court sits. So what this project is about is trying to change the trajectory of those stories for these people that end up getting evicted. We're trying to give them the resources and the hope to be able to know that the, there, is, there is a way to be able to, 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 be able to stop this, this, what they think is this inevitable progression to homelessness. Um, so the, the community housing support manager, the person who works for, who CHD hires to do this work, is a specialist in helping people find the resources to be able to sustain their tendencies. And if you delve into the narrative of, the, of, the, of, our, um, of our, our application, you, you, it gives you the flavor for the kinds of things that that, that manager's been doing. It's, it's things as simple as um, helping them maximize their income, helping them to get the benefits they need to be able to get them to the place where they can stop paying rent again. If they lost their job, if they were a working person, help them make sure they're getting on unemployment. Get them the food stamp they might be eligible for. It's also about helping them access uh, rental assistance programs for which we are lucky in Massachusetts. We actually have a state uh, benefit that, allow, that helps people who have fallen behind on their rents called the RAP program, uh, rental assistance to families in, rental assistance to families in transition, uh, which will actually pay up to $4,000 to help someone avoid, avoid addiction. Why does the state do that? Because they know the cost of homelessness is, is, is so much more. Um, it's also helping them just figure out a budget, a budget that they can work with and that they can then present to the landlord and they can and help stabilize. And that, that support manager is also going to play a role in, in, with that family until they've caught up with their rent. They're, they can act, continue to act as a liaison for problems that may surface even once an initial plan is put in place to help them stabilize. Um, so um, in sum, while for, you know, production is a worthy goal of CPA funds. We think that supporting our, our families here in Northampton who are in our community houses is just as worthy a cause. Thank you. Good evening. When we were lucky enough to receive funding for this in 2014, um, the message was conveyed very clearly that this should leverage additional funds. Uh, we heard that loud and clear, and we have tried. I just want to fill you in on the update of that. Um, the Center for Human Development made application to the city's community development program to fund a portion of this project. Uh, as the administrator of that, I can attest that it's a very limited budget, and we have um, 12 to 15 applicants every year that vie for those funds. The other piece to this is the Center for Human Development already administers a program in Northampton called the SRO Outreach Project, which is a freelance coordinator that um, links residents of the single room occupancy lodging homes with resources. Also, a homelessness prevention effort. So traditionally, CHD has applied to CDBG 
for the SRO Outreach Project. When they came in this last round, they had also requested funds for the Community Housing Support Services Project together in one. They asked for $20,000, um, the award was 10, which was the same number that they had received for probably the last decade. So with the SRO Outreach Program being their core program, when they needed to allocate the funds, the CDBG award went exclusively to the SRO Outreach Project. They also applied to Hampshire County United Way for this project for additional funds with the same scenario. They combined the two programs. SRO Outreach was a standing United Way agency they had gotten funding from United Way. They had asked for $45,000 per year and they got 20. And they went in um, in the hopes to generate more funds to carve off to this project. They did not get them there either and they allocated what they did get um, to their core program, the SR Outreach Program. We have also um, made outreach inquiries to the Northampton Housing Authority the executive director has said that when she sees this year's budget from the state, she will see if there's any ability in there to fund this in some part because a lot of the caseload of this coordinator, um, primarily the residents have been from Meadowbrook Apartments and the Northampton Housing Authority. I will say because of the present company included, that the Northampton Housing Authority doesn't actually end up evicting many of their families. They do work with them. Um, Meadowbrook is actually the highest evictor in the community. They're a national organization. We have reached out to them to contribute to this program um, and they are considering it. So we have gone to a variety of places and are as yet unsuccessful. Um, Center for Human Development is committed to continuing this program. They have contributed their own funds. The $45,000 that was initially allocated for the salary for this position, which is really what we wanted it for. We didn't want bus passes, client stipends, whatever. We wanted to give the staff person a living wage so they could be there full time. And we asked for three years, which you graced us with. So that person wouldn't have to worry about losing their job at the end of every year. And the whole point of this is to have a person that is ever present and trustworthy and not going to be gone, you know, in six months or a year because these families just need to be reliant on someone with that kind of ever present mentoring um, modality. So that is the commitment. Um, we have had some interest expressed by the Department of Housing and Community Development um, to entertain that as well. That probably wouldn't happen in the near future, but um, I will close by saying this program has been extremely successful. With a 57 family caseload, um, Melinda Driscoll Sabar, whom you will hear from on November 1st, has stayed 54 evictions. So. Our outreach to property managers with the um, argument that it's a lot cheaper to pay for this position than it is to process all these evictions in court, um, our next tact will be to go specifically to the property managers and ask them to kick in. It's a win-win, um, housing is stabilized, they don't have to go through the eviction process with folks. It's a lot more humane for everyone involved. So I think with that, I know you have a long evening ahead of you, so um, if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Um, when do you expect to hear, Peg, on the, I don't, I don't recall when the Housing Authority budget would come out and what's Meadowbrook's process, when do you expect to hear from them? Um, Meadowbrook's Regional Services Manager was the person that we had begun the dialogue with and he has left. So I'm waiting for that replacement to occur. And the property manager has also left. So we kind of have to start over there. I don't have a timetable there. Mm -hmm. The housing authority, um, <coughs> maybe Jeff can speak to it, but Kara has said her 2018 budget from the state, she has not seen it yet. Mm -hmm. And in order to consider something like this, there might be some procurement 
involved, um, which she is going to speak to the attorney about, the attorney being a huge fan of this program. So we're hoping to see something then. I don't, I don't really know when the budget is. Expected. It's really dependent on when she gets back to the state on the, on, on the approval process, and that's still up for grabs. And the, and the attorney's letter, um, Tom O'Connor's in the back of the, of the packet on that. Um, supporting it, but it, it uh, as of right now there isn't a there isn't a line item in the, in the budget as currently presented. But they don't know what they're going to get back from the state yet, so it is. <coughs> and have there been any discussion with any of the other property owners? I looked at the list of um, eviction eviction cases attributable to the, the various property management companies, and they're. Most of them were like one or two or mm -hmm. something, so it's not a. So just looking at that and being familiar with tight budgets, I would not predict that there'd be a, a lot of capacity or self interest in being able to really kick in money. But I don't, I don't, I'd rather um, have information from you than my own assumptions about this. Well, as this is, has evolved, we didn't necessarily predict, um, but the way it evolved was the Housing Authority and Meadowbrook were really became the bulk of the case. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the original design. Mm -hmm. um, Linda's presence in the housing court on Monday morning, it, you know, she really is open to referrals from everyone. Um, the support letters that were with the original application, Valley CDC, Home City Housing, which is now HMR, some of the other larger, um, apartment complexes. I think, well, I know Hap and Valley and Highland Valley Elder Services all contribute to the SR Outreach Project now so they can get the whole um, point of housing stabilization for the homelessness prevention aspect. So I think you're probably right that some of the smaller ones that aren't seeing a lot of the attention with this coordinator now would be reluctant. So that is that is why we're keying in on Meadowbrook and the Housing Authority. And is there a specific ask for Meadowbrook or you, you just, it's too preliminary at this point? Um, there was with the person that left. Mm -hmm. um, it's And what was that? What for, was the ask? For, there wasn't a dollar amount, it was just do you think you could contribute? And they were kind of running it up the flagpole. They both entities actually have resident services coordinators. So there's always this thought about, well, if we have this person who's assisting families theoretically, but the way that it really works is the reason why the Housing Authority never wanted this in-house. Originally, our concept was to have it there, but some of the philosophy is um, they don't necessarily want to advocate and assist families that in the end they may need to evict. So they preferred it be an outside agency, but there was the promise that they would support it. And Meadowbrook just had a change in the resident services coordination. She became an assistant property manager, so there's just a lot of flux. But there wasn't a dollar amount requested. It was just, this is what we've done in the last two and a half years. This is what it looks like. These are your numbers. What do you think about kicking in? And Trevor Samios, who we were speaking with, then left like two months later. Thanks. But we're, we're looking. And the reason why we came to you initially is because no one funds this. Um, it's not a typical service. In a, if you're doing a brand new development and creating new units as we are for the two Pleasant Street projects, they will have services on site. But this is kind of a freelance thing to service the developments and the units that are already out in the community. So there's just not too many places to go look here again, but we're we're doing the best we can to leverage other funds. And I think I think some more are gonna pop, but if we can't get the renewal and then it goes away, it's really hard to start from scratch. So. Mm. Is, is the oh, sorry. No that I, uh, with that in mind, um, kind of saving it off going away. Um, obviously three years is optimum. What's suboptimum? <laughs> well, the question, one of the questions you all put forth was a part-time position, and 
Um, I think our preference would be limping it along for maybe one year at a full time because it's really hard for people to navigate a part time staff person, find them, remember when they're there, and you know, be able to have them available during a crisis. So I think, um, and I guess I'm going to put this on the table. Um, our preference would be a full time for maybe one year with the proviso that we really do bring some other funds into this. Um, we, we went for the three years because, you know, it's kind of easier on everyone, but we're all very cognizant of the uh, demand on your funds in this particular round. The, the funding that we have, um, the current contract ends the end of March. Uh, there was a bit of a delay in the startup, so the funding from the original award actually goes through August. But we weren't sure if you were going to have money for the first round of next year, so we're here now. Um, because if you do your second round after July 1 next year, you won't have anything until December, so then we'll be out of luck. So that's why we are here. Um, the, other, the other plan B is to run it through August and get it as long as we can, and then maybe have somebody give us gap funding until we can come back into you after July 1 next year. So we're, this is so important. I mean, the emergency family shelter numbers, you know, there were 1,500 people in hotels and motels. It's down to like 46 statewide. And it's because of programs like this that are really helping people that have burned every bridge and experiencing many challenges to avoid homelessness. So. If stuff like this goes away, those numbers are just going to go right back up. So we really, really are looking to keep this going because it has been beyond our wildest expectations. I just want to add on it's the shelter working. program. Actually, if you're evicted from affordable housing for not paying your rent, you're not eligible for shelter. You just end up on the street. It's, 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 it's written to the race. Peg, the 54 evictions is through the life of the program, two and a half years. 54 evictions prevented. Prevented. The case is for the last, in the last two and a half years. Two and a half. And the, and the three, which Linda can attest to, were um, one person who had severe mental illness and just really couldn't be um, engaged, and the two other moves were for better situations. So. Really doesn't get any better than that. Other questions, Julia? Well, actually, that I was going to ask exactly the same thing, but now I'm kind of doing the math and thinking of, about. So, what you said was the the current funding takes you through March, correct? The current contract. Yeah. The current funding goes through August. Through August. 2018. August 2018. So a year would buy you to August of the following year. Correct. August 2019. Right, right. Yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to timeline this in terms of, you know, with a limited pot, for what length could, for what timeline could we potentially look at that funding if we did less than three years? And I can hear a request for one year, but I'm also trying to calculate in my head how that might look if it went a little longer, but not three. And, and then, uh, it's very helpful that the budget, by the way, is laid out as a three-year budget for us, I think. Thanks. So we have the data about the cases that were opened, the 54 cases. Do we have data on uh, of evictions that happened that just there was never a case opened? Is that in here that, or do we have that data? Were there evictions other than those, I guess, or is that? Not on her case, though. Uh, yeah, there were. Everyone Not on that her case, was, though, I know, but. Uh, everyone that she was engaged with is reflected in that 57. But yeah, not everybody. Not every, she wouldn't be involved in every case that got evicted. That's what I'm curious tenant, about. Of course, has to, it, it's voluntary that it begins with. The tenant has to right. want to receive that. I understand. Home. I'm saying, do we know, do we have a sense of the data? Uh, of stuff that didn't ever make it to this? You know, for Hampshire, I mean, it's hard to, I, I have a general sense of what the docket's like in that court, but it's a county court, so it's, I can't really think, speak to specifically Northampton. I'm pretty sure, though, that she kind of stuck her nose in anyone that had a Northampton address. She kind of inquired about what's going on. That was her method of doing things. Right. Um, and the landlords that knew her, uh, knew of her services, 
we're certainly willing to engage with her. Uh, no one wants to see an eviction go through. Right. I mean, it's rare that that's really the, the, the final outcome, but sometimes it has to happen. Uh, and sometimes it can be regretted. But Judge Fields, as soon as he knew there was something yeah. in North Hampton, he'd be like, Linda. <laughs> so. The judge is very involved in making referrals from the bench. It's sort of voluntary, but when the judge says, you either go there and you get the help, or I, I have no choice but to let the eviction go through, it's sort of a little bit coarse in a good way. So the 54 um, tenants that were helped, um, do you have a sense that there's like an upward trajectory <coughs> for them? Do you think that um, they, um, you know, are, are uh, moving in a direction where they may not be so dependent on all, all of these state, you know, programs that are out there for them? Or do, maybe it really varies, or maybe you don't know yet because it's been not that long. Um, I think you should ask Linda that question on November one, but um, she does very specific individualized treatment yeah. plans, so budgeting. I mean, there's every sense that it will, will be a positive outcome once they can disembark from her having a relationship with them. Um, it was always part of it that they do generic workshops, too, to kind of catch people upstream before they're in the 11th hour crisis. Mm -hmm. And Linda told me, because I was always pushing for it, that people don't want to do that. They don't want to go and sit in a room and have to, you know, admit to the world that they're really struggling. So it's it's very one on one. It's but it, it's clearly it's budgeting and managing and life skills and parenting and healthy food and nutrition. I mean, it's it's very holistic. So the answer to your question has to be yes. But you should ask her specifically. And and she's going to bring a tenant. She's going to bring a, a client household with her. Yeah, I mean, I noticed the, you said the, 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 there was a risk, you know, what it was called, it was a risk, risk assessment. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's so many different um, kind of categories that you're looking at. So I was wondering about, you know, education referrals and employment referrals and skills building referrals. Again, again, you know, keeping in mind that it'd be great to kind of build some independence, I guess, right. long term. Absolutely, that was the goal. And your predecessors, for those of you who weren't around, I don't know who's left from those days, maybe Linda, but the, the, the risk assessment and the performance matrix were required by you all because you didn't want this money going out into the abyss. You wanted to be able to have the program track progress. So those were created as requirements in the first go -round. Like before you sit, can I just ask one more time on this uh, possibility of long-term continuation funding? What I'm hearing is that we are we are the best. We are your best bet. If Meadowbrook came through, it would be nowhere near the cost of the program. That, um, and I'm hearing that uh, if we don't fund this, it will not get funded. Is that is that a valid statement? We're really committed to the continuation of this, but it's probably a safe statement. Any other questions? In 20, 2014, what was the amount that was funded? It was 195000 for three years, and that was forty five, really for the salary and not a whole lot of other ancillary things. And this budget, we talked about it. We said we want a full-time living wage position with benefits. So it went up to, I think, 80. So that plus some ability for a COLA over the three years, which is what got us to the 247. Thank you. Thank you for and your And you are aware of the date for public comment to bring people in? Yes. We have the chair of the housing partnership, uh, the other community legal, legal aid attorney, Linda, and a family coming on November 1. So. Great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck to you all. Thank Talk you. around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank all you. right. So next up is St. John. Good evening, everyone. Hello again. So just a quick aside to our committee members. So. David and Julia, we 
uh, I think the rest of us were, were at St. John's, so uh, we got a uh, hopefully good feel for the physical layout, but I'm be sure that we may look to you more for questions. So I guess we don't have a computer, so I... No, we're computer. struggling. That's we fine. So struggle. We, we were Girl Scouts at one time, and we came prepared <laughs> with the PowerPoint on paper. Yes. So my name is uh, Kathy Wanna. Um, and I'm representing the African St. John's Episcopal Church. I'm one of the lay leaders of the church. And with me tonight is Reverend Catherine Munz, um, the rector at the parish, and also Lee Anderson, who is uh, representing MANA, which is the feeding program that, that operates now three days a week out of our, um, out of our building. So um, what I'd like to do tonight is basically um, I kind of talk about three things in relation to this, this proposal. Uh, one is to really focus a little bit on the historic uh, significance of the building that we've been entrusted to steward into the next century. Um, secondly is to uh, talk about how St. John's and how this building functions as part of the St. John's community and how it's a resource for the people of the community. And the third is to, is to talk about how um, the portion that we are asking for is, uh, in this grant proposal, the funding, uh, how it uh, fits into the larger, um, what we call the second century project, how we are um, planning for uh, the next uh, 100 years in, in that historic building. So uh, first of all, St. John's has been around since the 1820s, um, but the building that we're in now, which was gifted to us by a wealthy businessman, um, made his fortune in New York, but was a local, George Bliss, um, was built in 1893. It's in the Romanesque revival sty uh, style. It's part of the Elm Street Historic District, and it has several very distinctive features. Um, you know, seeing it from the street, it's built of uh, Milford granite. Uh, it's got uh, the, some of the tour, you saw some of our beautiful woodwork that we have. Um, including a wood ceiling in the main in the main part of the church. Uh, we have a large stained glass window, and we have a historic organ that's been uh, that's that's uh, kind of a gem musically and has been maintained over time. Um, St. John's is really a community resource. We see it as a if you go by during the day, you'll say it says open for prayer. So it's one of the few places that people could come in and just have a quiet moment um, in downtown. Um, there were several, we have a history of being really a, a, an integral part of the community. Uh, several significant Northampton institutions were started at, uh, at St. John's, so everyone knows where the survival center is. It was originally in our basement, you know, collecting canned goods, and so it, it slowly, you know, moved into its own, moved into its own as its own uh, um, institution. Um, the MANA feeding program, where, where hungry people can get a meal. Um, was also started initially at St. John's and then developed on its own and has other locations that they serve from. And the Interfaith Cot Shelter, which is now, after many moves of places, has its own place downtown, but uh, St. John's is one of the co-founders with other churches for that, that uh, cot shelter um, program. So in terms of really looking at St. John's as a community resource, I think it's really useful to kind of look at the numbers like who comes in, who comes out, and who's doing what in that space. And so um, while uh, our typical attendance at services is about 180 on a typical week, um, counting up sort of the typical week and how many people use it for other purposes, about 195 people come in for 12-step programs, other support groups that meet in our buildings. Um, Nana meals are served to 60 to 150 guests a week. Um, I'll talk about how we've recently um, up, the, up the number of meals that we serve there. We've been a scout troop for 30 years of uh, developmentally delayed um, adults that have been made their home in our, um, in our church for their meetings. Uh, I mentioned the organ before. We also have some really amazing acoustics, so <coughs> it's sought out for um, musicians. So there's a drumming group that meets, the Pioneer Valley Games Chorus meets, and um, we also have a lot of other uh, students from the area that give their performances and stuff. So on balance, really, there are more people that are not members of St. John's using our facility than there are on a typical week than people who actually 
belong to the congregation. So we, we really view it as this um, as a uh, as a community resource. Um, if you look over our main doorway, it's, there's a carving that says "Given to Hospitality," and that was a carving that was done by a local artist, Clara um, Lathrop, and um, I think she's honored in the Hestia mural downtown. Um, and it really is for us a um, um, kind of a mission statement for what we do. We feel that it's really important and, and our actions show that we've, uh, you know, we really feel that the open door and the availability of space for all these groups to meet is, is really important. So um, we have future plans for community programs that would be enhanced by, our, by this project that we're working on. Um, the overall project involves accessibility because we don't have an elevator right now and it, it's really difficult for people to get down into the basement for, for meals and for meetings and also the kitchen needs to be brought up to, uh, to code basically. And um, so some of the projects that we anticipate moving forward with um, as part of this is additional manna meal offerings. We have been for many years doing Mondays, you know, doing one meal a week. And recently when um, the St. Elizabeth Van Seton um, feeding program was uh, kind of abruptly canceled, we were able to step in quite quickly and offer our, our um, facility through the MANA program to offer the meals they had been serving there so, so that there was no, so there was a continuity of availability for the hungry to have their meals. Um, so we'd like to add an additional fourth meal that's in the plans um, once we finish the project. Uh, other, other proposals would be cooking classes for people who get food at the Survival Center and for people from great women from Grace House who are um, single mothers in recovery. Um, we, we've, all, we've stepped up to take the Messiah Sing after Commonwealth Opera um, went bust and we'd like to expand that to include a kind of a reception afterwards. Uh, we will have some additional space for additional groups and um, we are always open for more performances, more musical, theater, dance performances in our, in our space. So um, we call this our second century project. We've, you know, for, we've gotten through in this building through one century and we feel that we have to steward it through for the next century so that we're available there as a community resource. Um, so the portion that we're looking for support here is uh, really related to the historic preservation aspects. So um, uh, fire protection is just the critical need. It's all the beautiful woodwork. Um, just would, you know, if we had, it would basically be a total loss. And right now we don't have any sprinkling in, in any of the, in any of the building at all, either there, either in the main portion of the church or in the other meeting rooms. So, uh, of course, we're putting on an addition that will a small addition to the rear for the um, elevator and for the, um, the the new kitchen, and so of course that triggers us needing to come up to code and sprinkler the entire the entire facility. Um, so that that's the portion of our overall project that we're requesting for the CPA grant funding to really protect this historical resource that's so well used by the community. Um, so what we're looking for is this fire suppression system, the sprinklering. Um, we do, the plan has been designed with, to be really sensitive to the historic aspects of the building, to not change the historic characteristics of the building. So from Elm Street, you know, we're part of the Elm Street Historic District. Um, I guess this is a good time for this. Um, you, you won't be able to see any of the work that we're doing. It'll, you know, the facade will remain as it is. So the the, um, the addition in the back is for the kitchen, uh, another meeting room, and the little taller spaces are the build out kind of a dormer for the offices that are being relocated by um, turning what are now our, what we call the parlors and our um, in our office space. The office space is moved upstairs kitchen is put on the back and we have the elevator and the stairwell that go on the back. But from the front, you know, we feel that it's been designed to really um, keep it uh, keep it as it is in terms of, uh, of the view. So, so the, the addition goes it's on the back. 
take a look. This long building on the side is um, the Smith Art Museum, and, and we've got uh, Elm Street in front there. So um, some of the things that we're proposing is to reuse the woodwork in renovated spaces. So although the existing staircase is coming out, we can take off the woodwork. And luckily, luckily we have a very skilled carpenter who's in, in the congregation who's um, planning to do a lot of this work and help us with that. Um, as part of the work that we're doing in preparation for this project, um, we took down some you know, suspended ceilings on our second floor and discovered a beautiful vaulted um, roof, uh, ceiling line, which we will we plan to be um, keeping as part of the renovation. And as I said, we're not going to have any changes in the front facade of the building. Um, the changes are in the back, and the design there has, has been uh, planned to be sensitive to the surrounding buildings, which is Smith Campus. We're basically a surrounded on all sides by Smith um, and the neighboring buildings. So the overall project, what we call our second century project, uh, is going to be about a $2 million project. Um, some of what you had in the application might have shown a bigger social hall off the back, and we realized that we just simply can't afford that. So that's been taken out to try to keep the overall um, amount to $2 million. We've been approved through the Episcopal Church Building Fund for a loan of up to 900000 we are we have um, 1.1 million in hand and about 1.4 million total pledged that we don't have all in hand yet, but been pledged by various folks. Um, and the, the difference will be the loan. The availability of some CPA money will allow us to reduce that loan, and the money money that's not spent on loan and debt service goes into our community outreach program. So. Um, you know, we are really hoping that that that, um, that you'll see your way to some uh, support for us for um, um, for this project, so um, so that we can maintain this beautiful resource, both physical resource for um, historic purposes, but also as a resource for the community with, through all of our programming. Great, thank you so much. So, any questions? Um, Sarah, can, can you just remind us of sort of preservation, rehabilitation, that the list that was given that does, that um, uh, Sullivan uh, with with uh, sort of marking what the removal remediation, well, all those are acceptable under the guidelines. Is that correct? So yeah. It's, so for historic resources. Uh, rehabilitation and restoration includes capital improvements or extraordinary repairs to make assets functional for their intended uses, and that includes code improvements for ADA accessibility or to meet the code. So asbestos removal remediation would, would fall under that? Yeah, and that's probably, I'm assuming that's probably being done to, to meet local building codes, because once you're, once you expose that, you're required to Great, thank you. Uh, questions? So, can you go? The plans that we have sort of have a social hall. And looks like it's been right. Yeah. So the rear. Uh, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's the difference between the two point five that's in the estimate and the total? And is that two point? So we are waiting for our hundred um, percent, not to exceed numbers from our general contractor. So originally, um, we've always had sort of the two million mark as something we felt that was manageable in terms of debt for us and. And all. Um, originally, there was a, and I think on your plans there, because that's what we had at, at the time. So this social hall is completely out of the front. That social hall is. There is a small, it would be turned into a smaller meeting room just to balance the, the building from the, to balance the um, appearance of the building. Oh, the so it gets smaller. And yeah, it's so, so originally it went out, you know, about this far. And now it's, it would just be a, a, a smaller room there, a smaller, meet, a smaller meeting room. Um, what other, so I know it's like just repointing of all the masonry in that estimate. I assume you're not doing that because you would have probably put that in. Well, there's, I think what we put in as an ask here are things that are relate, specifically related to the, um, to the, to the fire suppression system. So 
right. where there needs to be plumbing work or electrical work or uh, you know, masonry work related to that installation, which frankly is pretty complicated because it's a you know huge vaulted ceiling. We're trying to keep it, um, you know, not you know we don't want it to be as obvious. You know, we want it to be obvious in there. So that takes some doing. And then also because of the organ, there's a separate room for the organ that has to be you know, specially monitored so that you know you don't have false alarms that ruin a very expensive <laughs> historic organ. So dry, 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 yeah, dry, yeah. Um, so but are you doing the repointing? The repointing, but I don't believe there's repointing other than On the um, exterior? just the exterior as well, it was just done several years ago. Yeah. No, I think the masonry it's it's like minute, the masonry isn't a, like a full repointing. We actually did a, I don't know, fifteen years ago, I mean the, there were chunks on the tower. So we did a project as well. That was all done. done. I'm a, I want to say fifth, maybe the 15 years ago. Um, yeah. So it's not like a full repointing of the whole thing. Okay. It's just related yeah. to the work that so we're doing with the elevator, putting the additions in. But you also mentioned at the site visit the, um, just the, some of the water issues you were having. Yes. Right. Right. There are water issues into our, what we call the undercroft, which is yeah. essentially the basement, which we, which has been our gathering place and where the man meals have been held. So that is, that's also part of it to prevent that. So that's probably right. That's, yeah, hi. Yeah, that's, I, I'm Amory Martin, and I was one of the writers of the group. Yeah. So, yes, that masonry repair is really to the foundation of the building so that to prevent the water, you know, coming in. We have we had some water seepage. So it is preservation of the building, if you if you will. And uh, so it is just, that's what it is. It's around the, it's around the foundation. You're sealing it, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I also asked you about um, whether you're putting a perimeter drain or, or there's, where's that water coming from? That, that. We're gonna have some underground storage tanks for water. Yeah, there's a whole stormwater we will have aspect that there'll be underground tanks. Uh, we'll leave over here. And I, so it's part of the whole. It was a, but but again, that's not, you're not asking for money for the. No, no, no not we're not asking for it. money for the fire suppression no. and the related, the yeah. historic preservation components, which is the masonry and the, the fire suppression system to protect the building and and then the ancillary you know electrical whatever plumbing that goes with that yeah yeah there's no ask around uh, a water drain or yeah. store you know, evacuation I was hoping you'd say the opposite kind of, you know, <laughs> keeping water out of masonry is a very clear uh, historic preservation uh, yeah, well, task. Well, oopsies <laughs> <laughs> well but but um, about a year and a half ago we painted the inside of the whole church and we were getting a lot of um, peeling on the walls in there, uh -huh. and so we sealed the building yeah, from the outside. Okay, cool. Other questions? Um, Sarah, have, have you explained the, given any information about the current lawsuit pending before the SJC, just so there's just some knowledge of that? We haven't talked about it as a committee and how we'll deal with that. I have not. I haven't seen the, the latest update, but essentially this was a, a case filed by an interest group who was opposing use of municipal funding for religious institutions. Are you referring to the Baptist Church in Acton? Yes. 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 Was that not for, I think, a stained glass window restoration? Yeah. That was my understanding. Yeah. It was stained I mean, glass restoration. Yeah. I mean, I guess I think our, our feeling is that this is a somewhat different project because it's not purely an aesthetic thing, it's also a facility that's really used for a lot of um, good work in the community other than, you know, when they look at it. Can you, can you, uh, I know you've done that in your proposal, but speaking and in the questions, speaking to that tension between the use of, um, for the use of private, uh, for, a, for a religious institution to use public funds for a religious institution. I mean, there are people that, that are very upset over just the thought of that. You have shared those concerns mm -hmm. with me. You know, there's public funds for a religious institution, and, and that does not sit well with, with uh, right. certain people. <coughs> I understand, yeah, we understand that, and I think we're sensitive to that, but we really view our facility as, uh, as a community resource, as a community building. If you look specifically at who's in and who's out, on a typical week, it's not a it's not a it's not a church that's used primarily for church services that we let people occasionally come in and 
and sit there and you know have their meetings. You know, when we were actually planning this project, we what we did was uh, go to all the people who use our building and get their input about what do you need. You know, what what, what changes here would would suit the purposes that you, you that you use this building for. So I think. Um, I mean, I think the numbers speak for themselves in terms of you know who's there and who's benefiting from this building. I, and, and I, may I? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one of the things I want to say is that there's particular action around this using dollars, but I don't understand. The t I mean, I don't know that much about the Atkin thing, but I understand it's around stained glass windows. But I want to say one thing about historical preservation. If you wipe out old churches out of historical preservation, I mean, the history of New England towns, for the most part, has to do with the churches. If you, everyone takes a picture of the town center, and you look, and there's a church of the white steeple. So it's going to be very hard, I think. And I understand the, 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 the division. But I think if one looks at historical development of communities and history, we're looking to see as part of the institutions is the churches are you know provide a a uh, you know common uh, place uh, for the community uh, and that that's part of the history that the community has and St. John's particularly is interesting in the sense that it is part of the history of Smith College because of the way it was donated and how things happened so I, I, I would say all those Things uh, also, when one thinks of you know of, of preserving historical buildings in your community, um, that that's very important. I mean, I so anyway, that that's just one thing that I would I would say to people. And, and, and furthermore, I want to say this is this is obviously an ongoing um, issue in in many ways. And if some of you may follow, there I believe it was in the Midwest someplace where fed, there was a challenge this in the Supreme Court, I believe, to federal dollars used to provide some money to a church that was providing uh, some social services and whether it should be given. And the Supreme Court weighed down that the churches could provide, uh, and I, I wish I had the citation for you, but I could get it. Um, so that was the most recent des uh, decision. So I, I want to say there's, there's uh, decisions on both sides of, of uh, actually I'm going to say I don't know the decisions on the other side about not using community funds that way, but I do know this, that there's, there, number one, there's been a history of using community preservation funds in this way. In this community, and I think there there is a there are, there's gonna, there's some um, history in, in, and will be perhaps more challenges, but there has been some recent decisions uh, for use of, of federal dollars through churches. And finally, I want to say <coughs> related to what Kathy was saying, as a social worker, there are many many studies done, and one of the most efficient ways in a community monetarily efficient ways to support your community is to have vibrant church communities that do a lot of activities. The dollar per dollar is very cost efficient. So anyway, thank you. So you, I don't know if you want to sit down or not, but you mentioned your historic connection to the students yep. of, of Smith. So can you talk a little about what's your current relationship with, with Smith, Smith College, if any? Yes, we do. Well, uh, currently we, I mean, we take this, um, you know, mission and historic relationship with Smith College. So number one, we uh, do um, have what we call our pancake suppers three times oh, pancake, so uh, breakfast. breakfast. What do we call it? Midnight breakfast. Midnight breakfast. I'm sorry, I didn't want to try. Where we open our, our parish hall to serve you know, pancakes and um, bacon and sausage and uh, to serve in the middle of exam times. So we do it uh, twice a year? Yeah, every semester. Uh, every semester, and we serve anywhere from like I think the top was like 770 students one time. Kind of march, come in and get fed breakfast from we serve you know midnight breakfast from 12 from 10 o'clock to midnight a little later, and so that's a, a very uh, joyful event. So it's a way we do our, our our commitment to Smith College, and as well, we I mean this is a a, a little more of a churchy thing. We do have. Um, Actually, right now we just got a new person. I don't know if you saw us on the news. We're in the news. The back of my head was in the news, um, and we had a vigil on the St. Uh, John's steps for the um, um, people who were uh, killed and hurt in Las Vegas, and that was organized by um, uh, a Episcopalian student who is our um, liaison at Smith campus. So that person's job is to uh, minister the Smith costumes and and help. You know, go see them and help them out, and whatever. 
Um, maybe you want to describe a little more than I'm better job than I'm doing about what the job <laughs> is there. I mean, yeah, I started to jump. Up. Yeah. So Smith College has um, a really good um, relationship with us. Um, our old minutes of old meetings show that the congregation was angry because they couldn't sit down for all the students that were in in the church. And not, um, a now. not a problem now, but we do have a lot of students. I do have a lot of parents who will drop in at the beginning of the semester and go, and here's your pastor, and this is where you're going to sit. Um, but more than that, um, I have uh, sat with kids um, as they couldn't get away to go to the burial of their grandparents because it was exam week or exam time. We've had students who've come in and um, they've held um, like coffee houses in our parlors and um, they amuse me to no end because they walk in with um, fabric and they throw it over all the pictures of all the old dead white pastors and say, now this is a woman's <laughs> organization. And, um, oh, thank you. And um, a lot of times they'll stop in, they ask, they came over one day and they said, we, um, there's a gal from um, Argentina who was uh, an art student. And she came over and she said, in Argentina, when we open up a new gallery opening, we ask the clergy to come over and bless the art opening. And so she said, would you do that? So we got to go over there. And we've, you know, we've gone to their lectures. We've showed films on their campus. And, um, we, and I have lunch once or twice a year with the president of the college. And part of our conversation is always, how can we serve each other better? So we anticipate that once our construction is finished, and we expect to be done much sooner than they are with that library, we've already talked about how they can come over and use our, our sanctuary as a lecture hall. And they can use, we have Wi-Fi through the building, and they can use our library for a place to come over and study and have student groups and that sort of thing. So there is quite is a bit. you'd be donating, or would you charge for that? Oh, no, we would donate it to SMA. Okay. okay. So, and then the $5,000 that Smith pledged, um, they is, just is that the limit of their commitment? Gift. Yeah. Okay. And then the president also made a um, personal gift. Thank you for... No. 5000 but <laughs> we're happy. <laughs> Other questions? I also, if I may, can I have another minute? Sure. Thanks. Um, in the packet you got today from us um, is a letter from Mass Council of Churches. And um, the person who's the director of Mass Council of Churches, and this goes to um, Brian, one of your questions. Um, on the second page of that, we were nominated, and she doesn't, she doesn't name the institution because it was an internal memo, but I can tell you. Um, that it was Duke University. That um, me, bro, bro, you said you given this. Oh no, it was one that we it sent was over with an answer with your question. That, was, yeah. that, was, that seemed like a support letter, so I filed that with our support letter. Oh, okay. Let me um, just tell you what she was trying to demonstrate, because we've gotten your question about um, you funding a religious institution, and so. Um, it called to mind this nomination. We didn't get the award, but that's all right. Um, we were quite honored and surprised, frankly, that she um, really felt strongly that one of the things we were trying to do as a, as a church to um, strengthen our relationships with the community was we had asked all the people who were using our building what they needed when we went about planning this project. And um, so she nominated us for thinking outside of the box, because most churches, when they make um, some kind of a plan to expand, they're expanding you know, the sanctuary, they're expanding some other space. But um, we had really gone to the people who were using our building first. So I just Thank wanted you. to say that. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick question, on the, and this is for the MANA program. You, you make your facility Me? available. Is does the church contribute financially towards the food, or how does how does that work? Hi, I'm Lee Anderson. I'm the treasurer for Mana. 
Um, yes, St. John's has, aside of starting us back in the 80s, um, been very generous. They make contributions. Um, all the they host a um, concert, the Messiah Sing. All the proceeds from the Messiah Sing um, community donations are gifted to us. Um, they also do pledge to our budget um, from their community outreach fund that they have. So they're very supportive, and they're you know, from a point of view of a man, is entirely a volunteer organization. So as volunteers that work there, it's really kind of wonderful to know that St. John's is there for us, like this current situation where the, um, the church over on Holly Streets had to stop feeding abruptly. I, I just knew that there would be no problem telling Joan at that church that yes, we can, your next meal will be served, <coughs> knowing that I hadn't even asked Kat that yet, but it would, the answer would be yes, and the answer was yes. So. I mean, all of the MANA staff is support this. MANA has pledged to the Second Century campaign itself too, and support financially. Um, this, without St. John's, you know, we would be in trouble as a, as a meal serving program. We currently serve 60% of our meals in St. John's building. So for us, fire suppression and safety is important. Because if St. John's disappeared in a fire, we would lose our host facility for 60% of our meals. Um, you know, there's something to be said for the safety of the people that we're feeding there. And as Kat said, you know, looking to have um, a Friday meal, because there's no Friday meal in the city. Um, you know, we're bringing more people into the building. So fire safety is just more on our radar. So I, from Mana's point of view as, a, as an outsider, I would encourage you to support this because it, it will do a lot to assure that we have a place to feed, you know, for this next century. Thank you so much. Uh, other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So November 1st, you're yeah. welcome to have community folks or parishioners or whoever come and speak. Oh, okay. Uh, Great. It's a 7 o'clock meeting. Uh, On November 1st? Correct. Three okay. Wednesdays from now. Is that right? No, four Wednesdays from now. So, uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the first time we've ever done anything like this. So, <laughs> really, well, thank you so much for coming. And for the tour earlier. Wayne, are you awake in the back? <laughs> thank you so much for your patience. Uh, Wayne, we, the order we had down was the Mass Rail Trail, the Open Space Acquisition, the Kyle Fund, but however you want to guide us through these. Okay three, four, actually probably five projects, right? Two bikes and right. two acquisitions and the Cotton's Comp Fund. So whatever makes sense. I, I'll do that same order. Um, so let me start with the bike path. So this is sort of a, a really exciting opportunity, but also a lot of balls in the air. So we, we've been looking at, we've had metrics for a number of years, you know, let me step back. So we started working on all our bike paths in Hampton about 14 years ago. Um, we've gotten we the very successful the city pay for the design of the rail trails with some grants for it, but the funding of the construction is all federal funds. So we have, we've had $14 million of bike paths that have been completed in the last six years, last five years, um, and so we really built out our network. Um, we like to say that our bike path network serves 65% of the city. As we look at the bike path, we buffer half a mile away. But it's not really true because there's two sections where there's no legal on and off ramp for seven tenths of a mile. So from behind the registry of deeds up to King Street, there's currently no legal access on the trail. A couple places people do it behind Goggins Insurance and, and behind um, ServiceNet. Um, but there's no legal access there. We can lose those accesses at any point. And then in leads from the uh, VA. Uh, entrance to the park path all the way up to Florence Street. There's no entrance there. Again, there's some sort of trails that neighbors have done on um, the seven tenths of a mile. So we're trying to address both those things to say, okay, this, night, this bike path is serving these neighborhoods, but you can't get to them. We identify the spots, frankly, in large part from what's called desire lines. We look at where people are going illegally. Um, it leads where we've actually had a problem where people have been, and I'm not criticizing people who do it, 
but the lines have been so heavily done, this caused erosion, the trail is actually collapsing at one point. Mm -hmm. We had to come in and fix it. Um, and then we also, in Leeds, we had a request for Leeds Civic for the trail. Um, in uh, Edward Square, behind the church, we had a request from uh, the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association. Uh, and we had a series of public meetings, most recently, a week and a half ago, we did a rolling public workshop where we sort of rolled along the entire bike path and reached out to neighbors to come out and talk to us where they, they need access. So that's where the two have come from. So we have three, um, I'm sorry, and then there's the Leeds Rail Trail extension. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it leads, obviously, it goes up to Williamsburg, also. So we have some grant applications that are pending. We've already received a $50,000 grant. It's federal money that passes through the state. With some state, I'm not sure the mix, but federal and state money to help extend the trail in Leeds. We've applied for a $400,000 grant to extend the trail up to the, the federal grant is a 50% match, of which only a portion of it has to be cash. We have a $400,000 park grant, which is the state's recreation program, that will extend the trail into Williamsburg and the Look Park ramp. Um, and it has a 34% local match, and we have a $400,000 state grant for transportation of the Edward Square and Look Park, and that has no match per se for construction, but we have to come up with all the design services and the construction oversight. So this $250,000 that, that we're asking for um, is sort of a gap, not so much Edward Square, but I brought that in because it's sort of part of the whole piece. So it's the gap between what those grants are, assuming we get one of the two pending $400,000 grants. Um, if we get both grants, it actually doesn't put us in a better position because we're not allowed to use them as match against the other. Um, so in essence, we're, you know, we this great opportunity that we, I don't have to turn back a $400,000 grant. Um, obviously, if I don't get that grant, and we would know probably the time we have to decide, um, all we really need is fifty thousand dollars to match the grant that we have, already. and then we'll be doing a much more premium piece. We're optimistic, but I have to say there's no real basis for optimism. We think they're both great <laughs> projects, <laughs> so maybe they should like it, but we don't really know how competitive it is. You know, um, we just the same grant. We just spent four hundred thousand dollars on Pleasant Street as part of the. We spent other money as well from a different grant, mm -hmm. but the same Complete Streets grant we just spent at Pleasant Street. They know, we know they like their work, which is a good sign, but of course, once we get funded for one project, they may feel they want to spend money somewhere else. So I don't really know that piece, but I know if we get a grant, I don't. Is that a grant from both of these projects? So the, no, the, um, the, the Complete Streets grant will be Edward Square, which I'm not asking for any money from you for, okay. and Look Park. The Park grant is Look Park and the Trail into Williams. Is that why you group these into one application? Because of that. Because the money's a little fungible between them. Okay. So, you know, frankly, the, the complete streets grant is look, let's say I got both grants. Unlikely, but possible. Look Park should not only be a bike path off ramp, but should be sidewalk improvements. I know that's not a CPA eligible item, but we would be look we would be doing that. If we had both grants, we wouldn't turn back any money, but I'd still need money to, to match the other grants. Because you can use that money for grant money for sidewalks. That's right. Right. What is Edward Square? Wait. So you know the service, the old um, uh, armory building on King Street. Mm -hmm. Behind that is a road that looks like a driveway. It's called Edward Square. So we'd be basically be coming. There's a trail people are using every day. It's gravel, but we have the right to be so there. So that's the location you were talking about. That's not really right. Valid. Right. So okay. just before the North Street Bridge, we come down to Edward Square. We do a bike lane. It's really just 50 feet down Edward Square, and you use the North Street. Square. It's Right now, it's extremely heavily used because there's no the tunnel that's open yet. Mm -hmm. um, but even with the tunnel, and obviously the tunnel opening will take away a lot of that business, but it's still the middle of the seven tenths of a mile with no off ramps. It serves the densest non apartment neighborhood in the city and second only to affordable housing projects, one of the world's income neighborhoods. It's called environmental justice. So it serves a real need for people who don't necessarily have that much access. We ran, incidentally, um, numbers in Northampton of who owns cars, which is a car registration. And um, the car ownership rate per residential unit is about a third downtown as what it is in the most suburban areas. Mm -hmm. So we know, which, again, unit size is smaller. So if you just for people, it's about half the number of cars. But we know 
you know, lots of people own cars in town, but most people don't own cars. So that would be catching from Market Street to the trail somewhere, or the Edwards Square? Um, it would be on the west side of the tracks. So you'd, be, you'd, you'd get off the bike path onto North Street, and you go underneath on the road mm -hmm. underneath, and you'd hit Market Street. When okay. is the tunnel opening? Um, they've got to send, the National Grid have got to send someone to City Council for the poll, poll petition. Um, <laughs> But National Grid is getting up. So as soon as City Council approves it, and maybe that's tomorrow night or maybe it's two weeks, I'm not sure the timing, National Grid will almost immediately put the poll up. And mm -hmm. then there's only about three days for the work left. Mm -hmm. So at this point, they're saying October 23rd, but I think they don't really know for sure. And the ramp at Edwards Square wouldn't come through private property? It would. So we have an easement right. from, we already have an easement from um, Service Center. Oh, okay. It has some conditions. Um, that we do some earth moving so that they don't lose parking spots. Yeah. So I can't, that's why I, think it's, I can't really legally use that easement. Yeah. But I do have, and I, I need a short easement for National Grid. But, oh, yeah, okay. but the biggest one, the service center we had four years ago. Right. Uh, Wayne, can you uh, uh, forgive me, explain one more time. So if, if, the, if not, none of the land grants come in, then the look park access ramp is out. Is that if, correct? If the land grant and the complete streets grant doesn't come through, then yes, that's true. And that and, and you'll know that by when again? Um so land is it used to always be they told us right around election day. Um lat, two years ago they told us in January and last year they told us in late December. So any time between two weeks from now and the end of the calendar year is what we'd expect to know. Complete streets, the deadline was just due October 2nd, and they said two and a half months. And that one, they seem to be more consistent. So I'm assuming middle of the Middle of what? December. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Owen, and that's great. In the questions that you answered, um, given some of the funding constraints that we have, um, you feel completing the trail up to the Haynesville line is a higher priority? Yes, but because it's, we're trying to match the grants. Yep. So let's say we have the, just the Complete Streets grant and not the park grant. Complete Streets covers Leeds and doesn't cover one to Williamsburg and so we want to match that. So yes, if I had limited money, I could use it any way I wanted. The trail to Williamsburg is more important. But because we match a grant, we just don't, don't know about it yet. Sorry to make it so complicated, but that's my life. So how did Sorry. How did you decide on that location for the Double Park Access Ramp? Because that doesn't seem so far from the circle where you can get on easily. Right. So it came from a couple of different purposes. So one is we looked carefully at those, those desire lines. Where are people going? It's the one that's most heavily used. The second is there is a large population of homeless shelters and transitional housing at the VA hospital. Mm -hmm. And that little Sunoco station, not that it's that exciting, that's their destination. It's the closest commercial area. Now, there used to be another store in Leeds Center that's closed, but right. there's still a clear, heavy. So we're trying to, you know, we give higher priority to people who don't have cars. Obviously, we're doing these trails. So that's the desire line there. Likewise, in Leeds, there's a um, tax credit affordable housing project, and that's their nearest commercial. Again, I'm focusing on that because that's a small car ownership. And then Leeds Civic asked us for it specifically for the same reason. Because Leeds sort of has two centers, the downtown center where people live right. and it's the post office, and then the commercial center, which right now is just the snow club and hopefully grows. So it really came from look those two affordable housing projects, looking desire line and listening to Leeds Center. When we did our roll through there were people saying, hey, doing Warner Row actually gets more people coming up to the trail. It doesn't work for a trail that's handicapped accessible. There's not enough land that's there. So we may try to do something there, but it will be an informal trail. You have to walk on your bike. You couldn't be too steep. Too steep, yeah. And, and then obviously the right of way is easy. Look Park is fine with us doing this piece. So. Can you get to Look Park at that location? You can, yeah. So I'd say that for people who, not trying to cheat Look Park, but you're allowed to enter Look Park for free if you're going by bicycle. It gives you another interest. Again, if you're coming from downtown or Florence, you go on the other side anyway. But if you're coming from Leeds, particularly, you know, frankly, by bicycle, the distance is nothing. It doesn't really matter. You bicycle the extra distance. Right. But if you're walking, that's a, that's a more significant uh -huh. distance. 
Other questions for Wayne on bike stuff? Good to go? All right, moving on to the two open space acquisitions. So, um, two acquisitions, both really great opportunities at particularly good prices. Um, so, we've acquired, with your help, what we call the Rocky Hill Greenway property. It covers two past acquisitions that basically are the gap between Route 66, um, West Hampton Road, and Route 10, East Hampton Road. Um, we've already acquired as a two big parcels adding up to about 70 acres of land. We're eventually going to put a bike path in that area. This is the next property of the south. It includes three vernal pools. So from the it doesn't have a lot of wetlands, but from a habitat standpoint, it's really important wetlands. It's vernal pools are pools that dry out during the summer. So amphibians lay their eggs in them in the spring, and then they dry out so there's no fish that eat the eggs. Um, we've been working this property for a long time. Mass Audubon is our partner. And for whatever reason, the seller of the property has agreed to sell it at less than half the appraised value. They can claim the tax deduction. But, um, so we want to move and take, take advantage of that, what we think is a significantly below market price sale. And Mass Audubon is our partner. And it is paying some of the costs for that property. Um, I want to jump ahead if I could. I'll try the other property in a second. But one of the questions, whoever asked the questions, is what would our priority be between the projects? I want to try to word that a little bit differently. So I answered the question literally, which was our priority. But there's a different way to look at it. And I'm not trying to undercut Mass Audubon. <laughs> but Mass Audubon has signed an agreement with us to put up $81,000 for the purchase price. We agreed as part of the deal that we would ask for CPA help to reduce their commitment. So in the performer we showed, we gave you, we're only showing $40,000 from Mass Audubon. We have told Mass Audubon that we're doing internal competition and that we have to ask for money for our projects first. So if you were so inclined to fund these projects but didn't feel like you could do the full amount, we would ask you, and we've already told Mass Audubon we would be asking this, that you cut Mass Audubon's $40,000 before you cut one of the two projects. Because frankly, that doesn't kill them. You know, we, we like Mass Audubon. I've been a wonderful partner in this deal. Um, they broke with the deal. They've been great. And of course, they pay for this. They don't pay for something different. But it won't, it won't, Mass Audubon picking up that money won't kill the project. Us not doing one of our projects would kill them. So from that standpoint, that's my question. So that would reduce our ask from for the two projects together from 166412 to 125412. And that would allow us to fund both projects. Um, so I just wanted to do that while you're, that's fresh in. This, the second property is also an opportunity. We originally had signed a purchase and sale. I'm sorry, we originally did the appraisal. The, the land came in about $220,000. We signed a purchase and sale agreement for $200,000. Um, we then, we, we knew this site was valuable both for ecological purposes, for recreation, but also we're trying to build conservation areas that aren't just about open space, but also tell a story, a natural history story. And the property has some rich lead mines. So farmers used to mine their own lead when they were doing muskets until whenever bullets were made in Ohio. And then, the, the, and then it was cheaper to buy a bullet made in Ohio. That is, you know, a piece of lead encased in a shell and have it shipped by train. Because obviously after trains came along, than it was to grow, to put lead in your backyard. So the lead mine industry collapsed 120 years ago, roughly. Um, so the lead mine industry existed almost from 1654 um, until trains came along and came from Ohio. So it's an appealing property for that. The bad news or good news, depending on your perspective, is when we did our due diligence, there's more lead than we had liked. Um, DEP has signed off on us and said the exposure from people using the trail to walk is pretty minimal. Um, they just wouldn't want someone to live on one of these two properties. So we'd offer 200000 for two building lots. We basically wrote down the value of one building lot to zero because it's valuable for us, but it's not valuable for them. We'd still paid 100000 for the other lot. 
we think now that we've done the due diligence, though, that a lot's worth more than 100000 So again, if we don't move forward, we think the one lot with the lead mines they couldn't sell, no one's going to want that except for us, but the lot we're paying 100000 for may actually be more valuable. People would no longer be scared about lead mines because we've proven it's not that. So again, it's an issue for us for timing in, in the piece. Um, we also have a grant pending for this, it'll be 64%. So there's still some pieces in the album. Again, given the timing, if we didn't get the grant, we're going to try to figure out some way to sell cookies, whatever it is, so if you guys funded it, so we could try to fill in that gap. So there's no connection under the under Route 10 or anything between those two properties and the rest of the Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, the reason we put these together is last year when we came in for the conservation fund, there was a request when we knew for sure what our property was to sort of pull it out. So we sort of had a unnamed properties, you know, I can tell you the ones we're negotiating when we get to that, and then named properties. So the properties are separate other than the fact that you can get the money's fungible. You know, for, we um, often do fundraising, and we're very clear about that. Um, this year, as you may know, we've had our most successful year ever about buying open space. We have raised over $200,000 in, in community fundraising um, in the last year and a half that funded the projects, which is great. But we were so successful in part because we skipped a couple years before, we went back to people and said, we're not going to ask you every year. So we don't think that capacity is gone for future years, but we don't think we, could, we can't tap that. But again, we were very clear about that and we're very honest when, when we can do fundraising, we will in the future. Can, can you break down the two projects again? So yeah. Rocky Hill is how much? So Rocky Hill, which I brought my reading glasses. Rocky Hill is a total, um, I think it's by the line. So the purchase price for Rocky Hill is 142000 And then there's some co soft costs that add up to 38000 And the purchase price for the, what we're calling Galena Mines, is, is 100000 And the soft costs of about 10000 When we subtract the grant we hope to get from the state, the money we can get from Mass Audubon, assuming we're asking everything for Mass Audubon, that's $125,000. Um, the, so the CPA piece would be $50,000 towards the Galena Mines and um, $75,000 and change, $75,412 for Rocky Hill. Great, thank you. Would Mass Audubon ever be interested in extending their trails into the um, it's a good question. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're doing separate deals. They're, sorry, should, 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 they're, they're doing some small parcels on the other side of Route 10. One which we're working with them, which will be closing on, on the east side. On the east side, correct. And um, one which we're not involved with, which we've been negotiating for. I, I think they're looking at this as really important ecologically, and then they'll go back and think about trade. The, the deal we would do with them is either one of us would have the right to build trails. So we could without them, or they could without us, and then we figure out what the demand is for doing it. Earth and trails through the woods are really almost no labor and almost no cost. You know, bike path is incredibly expensive. But doing trails, we tended to sort of, when there's a neighbor group who wants to do sweat equity, we're happy to trails. When there's no one who approaches us, we tend not to. You know, if Sunnyside, for example, which is a butter, or almost a butter, thought it'd be a great place for a nature trail, we'd happily do it. Right. There's not a lot of homes there, so I'm not sure how what the demand would be. Or you want to have the use that would the sort of grassroots to right. Right. Okay. I mean, except for the bike path rock crossing Route 10, Route 10 is sort of a frightening place, so I'm not sure there'd be a lot of people driving on Route 10 and parking. But we are looking at trails from when we build the bike path trails going due south. So that's the most likely scenario for building something here is once we have the rail trail and people cut off through that. Um, right. Other questions about the uh, project? Okay, last but not least, Covenant Common Fund. So Covenant Fund, this will be a little different than other years. So. Um, you all know that the CPA Act requires us to put conservation restrictions on property protected with CPA funds. And that's always been a tail. We generally can't do that when we buy the land because we start to buy the land, survey it, mark the boundaries, then putting a CR on the property. So there's almost always a delay in the process. 
we have currently a, um, a deficit of, of CRs we owe of about $30,000, and we're going to get more CRs going forward. We tend to budget them in projects when we can, but we can't always do that. Usually, there's not a real time pressure unless you yell at us and tell us it's time pressure. Um, but sometimes it's a condition of state grants. So we try to be careful on having the funding for it. So if we get a state grant for buying land, they'll often say, we want you to catch up on all your CRs by June 30th, by the next funding year. So we sort of watch these things carefully. They're sort of underway. We've already paid for the surveying of them all. We're marking the boundaries. We're getting ready to get Sarah um, in-house and our partners not in house, are sort of working on the draft CR, so we're getting closer to getting closer. So that's sort of roughly about half the budget we'd like to spend from this program to, to catch up on what we have. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we like to partner with Mass Audubon. Mass Audubon is going to take the CR to that property and not charge us. So we work with Kestrel Land Trust, who we absolutely adore, but Kestrel doesn't pay for anything. So we actually have to endow the property. We, if we give them a CR, they charge us. A great group, but not inexpensive. Mass Audubon is still building an endowment, but they take care of that. They do the fundraising. They do the um, so that's about half. Then we have um, four pending acquisitions, and I never guarantee all are going to come through, but some will. But these are acquisitions that are at serious levels. So we've done some surveying in part with, with your money of Salmon Hills and um, the Borough Brook region. And we identified three in holdings where we own mostly around them. And it's important to fill those in. I will say those are not top priorities because they're not going anywhere, but we'd like to fill them in. We have to pay um, appraised value as that value just goes up over time. Um, so those are there, but not top priority. There's a property on Mineral Hill, on, on um, Sylvester Road, that'll be part of the Solomon Hills area. And that's a top priority because we have, we name our areas sort of aspirationally. So we have a Salma Hills unit on Ryan Road, and then we have a Salma Hills unit off of Sylvester Road, going all the way over to that section of Ryan Road, with a gap in between. Um, and it's a gorgeous gap. It's one of the nicest ledges in town. Um, it's used for people trespassing, walking, and bicycling, so it's an important one. Um, we're optimistic because the owner actually approached us. We had made an offer three years ago, which didn't go anywhere, and then the, offer, the owner approached us. So How many acres is that? Roughly 15 acres. Um, we've offered a couple, it's a stream that goes there, and so we've offered a couple of different property boundaries. One will be going up to the stream, one will be going to the bottom of this ledge, and we don't know what he wants yet. Um, but that's the right ballpark, depending on exactly the scenario. <coughs> um, and then there's another one which I would, is sort of sensitive. So if you want an executive session, I'm happy to tell you where it is. If you don't want an executive session, I will just tell you it's a one acre parcel of land that would allow a community garden next to a very low income of project. So we now, between Florence Community, uh, 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 Grow Food North Campus Community Gardens, which we leased for 199 years, and the Roots and the uh, Burst Road Community Gardens. We have 800 plots. Um, some are a little bit wet and marginal, but basically we think we have enough plots to serve the needs of people who have cars, middle class, white, and um, We know there are people in affordable housing projects who don't have access to cars, who aren't always comfortable and do have access to cars in growing food with people who don't look like them and have nothing in common, don't speak their language. And so we've kicked off a program to look at little, very small community gardens, half acre, next to some projects to serve those needs. We, besides serving recreation needs, frankly, it's really important for public health. Um, a lot of low-income populations have bad eating habits, high rates of diabetes, high rates of heart disease, high rates of strokes. In community gardens, it's not even so much about the food that you raise, but there's a sense that when you're raising your own food, you're a little more sensitive for the shopping that you did. Um, later. So even if you grow not much, it helps elsewhere. So we have a one acre parcel where we think final negotiations to purchase. Again, I, I, I'm happy to do an executive session tell you where it is, but otherwise it's, it's next to one of the lowest income, least served populations. And how many plots would that form? Um, In an acre? Uh, so most, 
So I'm not a gardener. The, the smaller plots are 20 by 20. People often get the multiple okay. ones. But there's rows in between, so you actually have a lot of shrinkage. Mm -hmm. So the property is about 20,000 square feet, but don't divide it by, 20, by, by 400 square feet because it's shrinkage. No, right. And then um, you have to have circulation in between. Yeah, and so I'm not quite sure what it comes to. Yeah. But it could be 30 plus plots. Yeah. Yeah. And this is currently an area which has eight plots, which for whatever reason the trustees have closed down. And they had a waiting list, but not a very long waiting list. So we're not trying to get a huge number. We think if there was an owner who was less um, uh, adversarial than the current owner, that we can get more people going. Um, we also get advertisements for itself, right? So you know, a lot of people are first generation Americans coming from more farm traditions. Um, and so we think that would be interesting. Questions for Wayne about the Cons Fund? And right now it's at zero. In fact, it's negative because you have outstanding conservation restrictions. Right, right. But, but so it's clear. I mean, obviously we'd like you to fund us. But we are going to fill those. We, 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 you know, we, we have our eyes open buying land. You are, you're under no obligation to fund them. I'm not trying to represent them. We'd like to do that, but we're going to have to have a bake sale or do next year's fundraising when we get out there to fill it. So we, so we will fill our obligation. We understand that. We spend it on the money we had in conservation fund. We spend on acquisitions that were time critical. So we made an internal decision that we weren't going to save the money aside for the CRs because there were opportunities we'd lost, knowing full well that you would hopefully fund it, but that you weren't under obligation. Have they come up with a fifty thousand number? Yeah. Uh, really, just history with you all. Um, so I guess that's the answer. That you know, we'd asked for more and you didn't give it to us. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the short answer. And what we tend to be is the big acquisitions, we come to you as name projects. Right. So it tends to be these 10 acres, 15 acres, and then the CRs that we use this for. Um, and it's probably about a year's, I mean, depends on how fast things go, but it's probably about a year's worth of things. I'm assuming it's not going to be around in the winter, so we're trying to think, you know, given how competitive this round is, so I'm wondering what does it take to keep us alive in the next round. But you can give us more if you want. <laughs> no, but I'm really, I was, no, I was going to go back to the rail trail, so go finish oh, up on this one. So, so when um, you came to the historical commission meeting a month and a half ago and presented the proposed updates to the open space plan, um, do you feel like what you present here tonight is a, a, a fulfillment of uh, your next steps in that plan is it? Do you feel like you're moving methodically? They're not having not, not having the document in front of me and having yeah, yeah. Do you feel like it's a fulfillment of the um, the strategy that you've developed for that? So, so four things in particular, all which I mentioned just very quickly. That we so the open space plan is still draft. There's four things we've called out. One is more focus on heritage landscapes. Right, so that's the mineral. That's, that's the mineral the hills. Right. Second is the community gardens thing I just mentioned. Um, put, being put in there, so that's why it's a top priority um, for that piece. Third is trying to get, we, again, we love Kessler, this is not a criticism whatsoever, but trying to get a handle on the cost of conservation restrictions. And so developing new partners and frankly getting both Mass Audubon and been working with Friends of Northampton uh, Parks and Recreation, we're trying to get competition with Kessler. You know, when last time we went to bid, nobody else bid on CRs. Um, and I'm sure it's a real cost for them, but so that, that sort of helps build that piece. Um, and then that whole thing of connecting the meadows to, to the state hospital at the upland is the other piece. So yes, we think we're getting four specific things. Linda? Uh, just going back to the, the rail trail, there was a question asked about maintenance of the existing trails. Um, uh, if you could expand on that, not just not just you know, mowing and so yeah. forth, but resurfacing, really um, protecting and yeah. and repairing what we've got. What are, what what are the provisions? So there's that? a few answers, I and mean, there's been more detail than you want, but just quickly. So <laughs> um, you all know we've been buying land aggressively. So we went from when we did the open space plan seven years ago, we had preserved 15 percent of the city. That we now have preserved 25% of the city. So in seven years, we added 10% of the city, a substantial amount. We went from 5% 30 years ago. So we protected a lot of land. Um, 
we, with a lot of help from you, have been professionalizing what we do. We had been used to survey all our properties. Now, whenever we buy land, we survey. You funded two of the three big surveys that are out there. Um, anyway, in that same piece, the mayor and city council authorized us to have a 50% position who's a, a, a field guy who goes out and maintains. I'm sorry, when I just got the rail trail, the bike, bike trail. Right. Well, okay. Right, so that's part of it. So we are now, as part of that position, we are now maintaining, doing some things from the bike paths. Um, so we coordinate the adopt a trail program, which is, is mostly volunteer driven, it's mostly picking up trash. We do things like take down guardrails. We were required to put up a lot of guardrails. The state made us do. Um, it makes it very difficult for DPW to, to plow and to cut brush. Mm -hmm. So they, don't, they, haven't, they haven't done a lot of mowing because it's really hard. Because of these fences that they have to mow behind the fences. So we've been looking at wherever the hills, wherever we don't need them for safety, we've been taking them down. And now they have a person that's been great. We take down them there and move the wood to conservation areas where we're building boardwalks. So we've been doing that piece, and then we also do the grant applications piece for other grants. Um, DPW's been doing the mowing, and it's been slow to get them to expand from the original core three miles to the entire trail, but they've been expanding. Um, Leeds are now doing a good job of mowing. Towards East Hampton, not as good a job of mowing. They've asked us to do this fence project, so it's easier. So in terms of routine mowing, it's getting better each year, and we're making their life easier. The massive resurfacing, so the 20 to 30 some odd year trail, um, we help them apply for a state grant, which they have not gotten yet. But we're looking at that's probably more money than they would be willing to divert. From ch so we get a bunch of money from the state called Chapter 90. You could use them on bike paths, you can use them on other roads. They feel the backlog of roads is so bad that, that it's not moving to the bike paths yet. So we've been applying for funds for that. It's eligible for Chapter 90, but not. Um, and trying to sort of do a better job in drainage. So last year we had some money to extend the trail north of Leeds. We actually redid about it. So it was a, we extended the trail three tenths of a mile, and we redid one tenth of a mile where it had poor drainage. Drainage is the biggest killer of asphalt mm -hmm. that's out there. Um, so the, so lots of different pieces in play. The big resurfacing isn't going to happen until we get state funding. The small resurfacing there are maybe. 30 areas where there's big root problems, and that's a matter of cutting the roots or maybe cutting the trees and redoing that. That DPRB seems to be willing to do at some point. I'm not sure when that happens. Um, but the, the original three miles, that's not going to happen for a while. So. Okay. Thank you. There's no glass in any of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions for Wendy? Um, if, if my calculations are close, in tallying up all three of these proposals, I'm getting somewhere around four hundred sixty-six thousand dollars. You know what our budget is, which is very limited. Um, you sort of prioritize the bike stuff and maybe the open space acquisition. But you know, um, given the incredible constraints that we have as a committee, taking all of these projects. Is it an unfair question to ask you to try with that? It's not unfair. It's always hard because we have different clients, if you will. So I, I apply on behalf of Comscom for open space, on behalf of transportation for bike paths. Can I offer it a slightly different way? Which is I think there's about $164,000 in the open space reserve. So one approach is if you reduce the open space down to 125 and then fund the conservation fund, my math isn't going to be fast, but so that, that it, oddly enough, you grant us whatever you have in the conservation, in the uh, open space reserve, then we're sort of not competing with anybody else for those projects. Um, and okay, I totally understand the competition, but those, those aren't funds you could use for any of the projects that are before you. Um, and for the bike paths, um, again, the one to Williamsburg is more important, except it's really going to depend on the grants. So, what I'd love to do as the fall goes forward is keep you in the loop and come back and answer that question. I mean, as soon as I, he as soon as I hear from a grant, I'll let you know immediately. If I don't get a grant, other than the $50,000 for the, the max the grant we already have, we'd withdraw the rest of our money. Your money's mm -hmm. not enough to do what I want to do anyway, so it wouldn't do it. So I'd withdraw. If I get the grant, then that's, you know, a condition. You would withdraw the 200000 Correct. Not the 50000 Correct. And if you got both grants? 
you said you would still want the 200 because you would do a, the sidewalk, et cetera. Correct. Right. Right. They each have different matches that we need for them. Um, I'd have to look at the exact, but if I got both, maybe it's on the margin something less, but it's not going to be dramatically less. But of course, um, if we got both grants, probably fundraising capacity goes up as well. You know, the bigger the things we can do, if we can do three projects, the fundraising gets more exciting. We want people involved. The fact that you've applied for two sources of funds, though, it's one, that's not going to influence a decision on one branch or the other from the funding agency's point of view. It doesn't in the Do formula. they know? Do they even know that you've applied? I don't know. I mean, the lieutenant governor, and we got the $50,000, did a big spe did a big piece, um, you know, just a big, you know, press event. Um, there's nothing in the point system that would make us lose, and we could tell a compelling story how we're doing extra stuff. Right. There's always stuff that's not in the point system that's yes. harder to evaluate. Right. Um, I don't think, I think complete streets and, and park are a totally separate world. The fact that we got $2.5 million in MassWorks didn't hurt us getting the $400,000 complete streets. Mm -hmm. It's the park grant versus the recreation grant we just got that I'm a little more worried about. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I, I asked a, something you've gone over already. The, I, I'm a little confused with 125000 for the open space acquisition. Can you just explain that coming down from 166 one more time? So, in the performa I gave you, we asked for $41,000 uh, 41, to reduce NASA Audubon share. But if you tell me what do I cut first, I would rather ask NASA Audubon to contribute more money. They, they signed an auction with us where they're coming up with $81,000. I'm willing to hold them to that option. We did a handshake side agreement that said I would ask you. I've done good faith in asking you if you've lost the money, we'd love it. But it's not as important as the money. I agree. So it's the 41000 uh, that would go to increase the ask of mass auto. That's to increase their obligation. Right. Any other questions for Wayne? That 125 corresponds to the land grant match. Uh, for one, it's the land grant for one area, and it's the uh, mass autobahn match for the other. Area. And soft costs, and that one does include the conservation restriction built into the project. Okay. Usually, incidentally, for the big projects that we do, like these name projects, we build the conservation restrictions into the budget. So we don't come back and ask for more money in a conservation fund for a big CR. It's the little ones, 10 acres here and 15 acres there. And we deliberately save those for a couple of years because part of our cost is the agency that holds the CR, we're paying their attorney's fees and their staff time. And so it's the same cost for I do a CR in 10 acres as 100 acres. So I want to accumulate it, but that's why the budget becomes a little more complicated for us. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much. All these numbers somewhere mm -hmm. Next week. Yes. <laughs> 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 Any other before Wayne leaves? Are we good with questions for Wayne? Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that leaves us with uh, is it four more two weeks from now? So we have nine for it. get the site visit at a location to be determined and Sarah will get back to us um, on the, on the uh, but you can't pick up the rocks no yeah. don't lick the rocks right. <laughs> other business not foreseen when the agenda was published motion to adjourn so moved. in a second all in favor yeah.